Good morning, HEC. Let's worship God together. We get to celebrate victory in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Heaven thunder and the mountain. 
it is for Life begins and ends in the dust you form Faith commanded and the mountains move Fear is holding ground to our hope in you Unstoppable God, let your glory go on How we all doing today? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. We are Maurice and Samantha Milton. And we want to be the first to welcome you back to the 930 services. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> if you're new with us, we'd love to connect with you. And there are several ways that you can do that. One way is by filling out this connection card right here. All you gotta do is fill that out. They're located in the back of your seats. And you can drop it in the buckets on stage, or you can take it back to the welcome desk at the end of service. Another way you can connect with us is by scanning the QR code, which is found in the seat in front of you, or by texting HCC New to 94000. Again, we're so glad that you're here with us in the house of the Lord this morning. Maurice is going to pray, and we'll get right back to worship. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful Sunday, Lord. And Lord, we just want to come together right now and we just want to give you praise for every great thing that you've done lord so just 
bless us all as we give back into worship. In your wonderful and precious name I pray, amen. We know that some may come into the house of the Lord feeling broken, but God in his amazing grace, how sweet that sound. He saves us. He saves me and he saves you. So let's worship him today in truth and in grace. In Jesus' name.
broken because there's power in his name to do that. Victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. of Jesus. Yes. You, you may be seated as we're transitioning our worship into tithe and offering. I know you've heard it once, so I'll say it again. Tithe and offering is absolutely still an act of worship. Maybe you need to raise your arms up and give a shout when you bring your offering up today. That's okay. But just because we're not singing, we're still worshiping. Our lives are an act of worship. Last night I was um, doing laundry and making our bed and I heard our kids downstairs playing a game of sorry with my husband and he had asked me to come. He's like, Just come play sorry with us. And I'm like, I don't have time for that. I have to do laundry. I gotta finish this up. I gotta finish the kitchen. You play and have fun. I got stuff to do. 
And as I'm literally pulling the sheet across our bed and tucking it under, my thought was, I am a Martha. <laughs> if you don't understand that reference, it comes from Luke chapter 10. And Mary and Martha were also followers of Jesus because Jesus didn't look at women as anything less than men, which was very countercultural. But Jesus came to the house of Mary and Martha. And Luke chapter 10 says, Martha, or she, had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. I am Martha, and that hit me hard last night. Because how often are we so focused on what we think we're supposed to do that we miss the very thing that Jesus called us and told us that we needed to do? We are so busy at our jobs and at our work and at our homes and even here in ministry, doing everything that we're supposed to do, getting things done, checking them off the list. And if you're like me, you really love a good checklist and it makes you feel accomplished in your natural self to get those things done. But Jesus looked at Martha and said, Mary has chosen what is better. Not that those things weren't important. The ministry is important. Our work is important. Our homes and our families are important. But when we're prioritizing that, when Jesus is sitting right in front of us, we're missing the picture. So this morning, as I'm thinking, I know this ties to tithe and offering somehow. And it does because we're always trying to do what we're supposed to do. And often that looks like we're trying to save money, we're trying to make smart investments, we're trying to use our finances in a way that makes sense to provide, to do what we're supposed to do by the world standards, to have nice things and take care of us and our families. But Jesus tells us what we need to do is submit to him. We need to give him the first 10% of our increase. We need to submit to his lordship. We need to lay it as his, at his feet, just as we submit our lives at his feet and trust that when we just bask in his goodness and his love for us, that he will give us opportunity to take care of the rest, that he himself will take care of the rest. So don't be a Martha this morning. Yes, take care of your home. Do what you're supposed to do. But just like Mary sat at the feet of Jesus, which was actually something that students would do before a rabbi, which women were not allowed to do at the time, she did something counter to the culture, and she did something that Jesus called her to do, and she was better for it. So do something counter to the culture, and instead of hoarding your money for yourselves, invest in his kingdom, listen to his word, tithe, and offer an offering this morning, and watch as Jesus just pours out his blessing into your life abundantly over and over, because his word will never return void, and his word tells us that if we submit to his lordship with our finances, with our time, and our talent, and our treasure, he will bless us. Father, thank you for this opportunity to be a Mary to sit at your feet, to bask in your love, to give you our adoration, God, to recognize who you are, Lord and King and God of the universe. Father, we submit to you in every area of our lives, including our finances, God. I just ask that you bless every tithe and offering that comes in, that you bless those who are giving of their time and their talent and their treasure this morning. I ask that you take this offering and you do immeasurably more than we could ever imagine with it to change the lives of our community the people here and to accomplish your will we just ask that your blessing be over these finances in jesus name amen
Good morning, good morning, good morning. So glad to be back. I'm ready to preach. I'm ready. I love you guys. I miss you. Those that are online, I missed you as well. I want you to know that, like I tell my children, the secret is out. 9.30, welcome back, and you are my favorite. <laughs> yes, I'll tell 11.30 the same thing. <laughs> when you have four kids, you have to be creative. It's not lying. Ish. You're my favorite. Ish. I uh, had a crazy month of July, but I am, I'm glad to be back. We're about to get into the school routine at our home. Um, God is so good, and uh, we have learned that uh, we have a tendency in the Moke household, I don't know about you, uh, to think we know better or that we know what's going to happen tomorrow. How many have come to realize that when you're on this Christian journey and you open your wings but God supplies the air that you realize you don't always know what tomorrow holds? Is anybody in that boat, right? Or you think you'll want to do this or you'll want to do that. Uh, My amazing wife, Amanda, has uh, been a stay-at-home mom uh, since she was late into her pregnancy with our fourth child. Uh, After three and knowing she's going to have four, she's like, eh, it might be best if I stay home. And it was an amazing, amazing decision. Um, We we survived the last 10 years, I believe, well because of that decision. But there began this feeling in her that she was to step back into the corporate world again and and maybe get a job. And part of that deal is because Curtis leaves for college on Saturday. So uh, in case you didn't know, education costs money. Uh, I know you know that. So we needed to get a little bit creative and being able to, you know, bring in some new resource and support that. So we began to pray about that and put that before the Lord. And we didn't know exactly what that looked like, whether it was going back into the uh, beautician profession, which she does, and or what it might be, um, but God is just so good. And uh, how many know that when you're in His will and God's moving, th- things just find you, don't they? They find you. So uh, we do have a tremendous heart uh, for the public school system here in Hamilton. We have a tremendous heart for the city, and we've shown that through endeavors of City Conquest. Hamilton Christian Center had that for nearly 15 years, where we were in the schools. Uh, after that, we transitioned. We continued to do assemblies. We were always in the schools. And then we began to create a, a, a ministry called S2 Hope and Future. We provide basketball shoes for every single boy and girl, grades 7 through 12. We've done it now for four seasons. And it's just been an incredible, a lot of that has to do with you. We partner with some businesses locally as well. But the majority of the funds come right here from this church. We'll be asking of that again in the, in the month of October. Be prepared for that. But God's got an idea, I think, to do more. So what does he do? He moves upon the heart of someone very, very high up in the Hamilton City Schools and someone connected to this church and says to Amanda, there's a new job that's coming up in the Hamilton City Schools. I would strongly encourage you to apply for it. And she's like, what? I haven't written a resume in 12 years. So you, no, no, no. So she finally gets the job description. It's like one page and another half page. And she's like, ah, ah. you know, when you've been stay-at-home mom for a while, you, you, might, you might lose a little bit of confidence to be out there in the corporate world. He comes back, nudges her again. I, I would apply for that job. The job is this. God is so good. There is a law that was passed in the 80s by the state of Ohio that creates funds for homeless children in the community. And it's all across the state of Ohio. And there is funds set aside, but you have to have someone to manage those students. We have about 400 homeless students in the city of Hamilton. And Amanda will be responsible to make sure they get an education, make sure they get food, make sure they get clothes, make sure they get athletic apparel, and make sure that they get an education. So I don't know about you, but I think God is good. And when the Bible says that the New Testament church is to be about the Father's business, part of that mandate is to take care of the homeless or the least of these. Yes. So that being said, we have an incredible merger and partnership, and we absolutely see God moving and His hand being upon this. So we're really excited about what God is doing in our household. Isn't that good? 
I want to communicate just a couple of things, then I'll be promoting some stuff as well in a sermon. The fall normally gets busy. Uh, it's back to school, it's you know, back into a little bit of a routine, but even for the churches, people have a tendency to kind of lean back into church rhythms and show up a little more frequently when you get into the fall and you get out of vacation mode and summer mode and all the different things. So churches have a tendency to be prepared for the people to come back and be a part of us more consistently, and that's still the case. And we want to offer some things for you, and I want to talk about that. First thing I want you to know is this Wednesday, everybody say Wednesday, Wednesday. 7 p.m., okay? For three weeks, I'm going to dive deeper into some Bible study, and I want you to come be a part of that. It'll be down in Fireside Hall. It's going to be called Why We Believe What We Believe. And I want to dig into the relevancy of the church, the importance of the church, and why we should be a part of the church. And I want you to be able to dig in with me a little bit more. How does that sound to you? We can do that. Hey, we'll get into some hot topics too. We'll talk about some edgy stuff. So I want you to come and hang out with us for an hour, hour and 15 minutes on Wednesdays down here in Fireside Hall. Next Sunday is Next Gen Sunday. How many believe that it's important we invest in the next generation? How many believe that's important? Yes. Well, we're going to highlight our kids. We're going to, sorry, nothing against you guys, but these first three rows are going to be reserved. So if this is normally your seat, give it up for the kids, please. Uh, They're going to fill those up in both services. We're going to have kids up here shadowing worship team members for song one and singing with our worship team. We're going to have kids take welcome. We're going to have kids take the offering. We're going to have kids help me preach. It's going to be an amazing Sunday where we highlight the next generation. And then at the end, we are going to bless all them as they go back to school. So please be with us next Sunday. How many know kids are just absolutely hilarious? We don't know what's going to happen, and that, my friend, is the beauty of it. So please come and be with us next week. All summer, we have had different themes. June, it was Know the Faith, and we really dug into some apologetics and some reasons as to not only knowing the faith, but why we should know the faith and why we should know the Word of God and the importance of that. Then we went into July and boy, we had an amazing experience as a church. We heard from Pastor Sloan. I heard from me week one, Pastor Sloan week two, week three, we heard from Leroy Brown and week four, we heard from Laura who did a phenomenal job and then we heard the last week from Mark Cunningham, our youth pastor. And it was just an amazing month of people continuing in that theme of sharing the faith, the importance of Breathing in and also breathing out as we testify to the goodness of the Lord. Now August is together in the faith. And how important it is. Jesus even prayed about this unity coming together. The expression of the church, which is the church, is not a building. It's you. It's us. Coming together and worshiping him. Giving of time, talent, treasure, and testimony to further what? His gospel, his message that is relevant, listen to me, to every single person. Everyone is eligible for salvation, and everyone is eligible for eternity separated from God forever. forever. And that's our motivation, that we come together, we be the church. So together in the faith. You know, it's been a little while since I've prepared a sermon, so I want to tell a joke. Uh, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Not really. But anyway, uh, maybe it'll help you. Uh, so, this dad in his office at the house, this kid comes over, and looks over his shoulder. Dad, how do you know what to preach? Son, I say what God tells me to say. The little boy goes, well, Dad, why did you cross words out? (laughs) That's a joke, guys. Really, when it comes to a good sermon, it's what you leave out. It's really not what you put in. So I guess the pastor lied. I don't know. I'm a firm believer that Better and greater things happen in the confines of relationship. I know it's a risk. Why? Because with every good relationship, I'm sure you have a bad relationship experience. So in the journey of life, 
when a preacher comes before you, might I tell you that I have been burnt? Might I tell you that all of the investments that I have made in other people have not always been flowers at the end? I know, me too, I get it. But that cannot stop us from being the church and the church being each other. No matter our backgrounds, no matter what we are or who we are or what we've been through, we've all been saved by the same grace of God and we are to do life together. And I believe that a church that does life beyond this hour and so odd time together on Sundays is a church that has greater impact in its community. A church that doesn't just check off the box of I came on Sunday, but I want to do life with you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, I believe is a church that's stronger. I believe it is a church that has greater potential for impact, and I know that the Word of God attests to that. The Bible says that the New Testament church did not start so much in temples as it did in homes from house to house. They broke bread. They took communion. They prayed together. They laughed together. They cried together. They went over the teachings of the apostles, which the teachings of the apostles was not just the Old Testament, but it was also the New Revelations as they had experienced Christ one-on-one, including Paul, who met him in his resurrected state. And they conveyed this better way, this new covenant, the New Testament that we have now. I heard someone say the other day about the Old Testament and the New Testament, I thought it was beautiful. Why, when we have this Bible as the New Testament church, 80% of it is the Old Testament, but yet only seems 20%. Like you... Grab your Bible and look at it sometime and see how thick this old covenant consists of our Bible. And the person said it was because it doesn't take as much to write about what love can do and what the other two-thirds of the Bible was talking about, how we can have relationship with God, how this relationship with God works, yet it took just a small portion to be able to convey this better way. I thought that was profound. I'm here to tell you that God is good. He is faithful. He is trustworthy. He is loving toward us. These characteristics, if we, if we trust Him, well, it requires a proper response of also our love toward Him, our faithfulness toward Him, our trusting of Him. But it doesn't stop there. We also need to Have faith and belief and hope and pursuit of each other. Even if we don't feel like it, we need to strive to do life with others, praying for each other, trusting God's word that it's been spoken over us and he will fulfill it. I don't know about you, but I need you to believe that for me sometimes. Because sometimes I struggle to believe it for myself. The gospel not only justifies us and reconciles us to God the Father through the Son, but it also reconciles us for His glory. That others might know Him because of why? Our relationships. How healthy they are. How forgiving they are. How different they are than what we see outside the church There should be such a love, an adoration, a pursuit, a willingness to forgive, a willingness to honor that is so great, people want to knock down the doors to be a part of who we are. That's just what I believe. Today I'm going to teach from a book I've never taught from before. Now I grew up with it pronounced Philemon. It's a man, Pastor Sloan, first time I ever heard it. He used the word and the phrase Philemon. They're pretty big difference, just so you know. So if you hear both of them today, it's just my old self and my new self coming together. But the book of Philemon. Let's talk a little bit about the background of this book to help you. Paul was a prisoner in Rome. His friend Philemon was in Colossus. 
And the two individuals had a common person that they knew by the name of Onesimus. And Onesimus was a bondservant to Philemon. Another word that would be probably more relevant and have even a deeper impact, he was a slave. Now, the slave that we would understand in the current text is not exactly the same. For Onesimus would have owed a debt to this businessman known as Philemon, and he would have to work that off. But I can tell you this, those who were in debt to the businessmen and the Romans of that time were still considered less than, and they were treated horribly. So to understand better this letter, which is only one chapter in all of the New Testament, Philemon is one chapter, 20-something verses, but it speaks to the importance of what Christian community is. And Paul speaks heavily in this, and we're going to teach from this today. What had happened was Onesimus had robbed Philemon. And there was severe punishment expected by fellow businessmen in that culture. And typically it involved execution. So Paul met Onesimus and Onesimus' father. And they came to know Jesus in the course of his journey after robbing Paul's friend Philemon. Are you following so far? What is Philemon to do? He is a local businessman transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's friends with the apostle Paul, but his bond servant slave has stolen from him. Society says you got to do this, but the Holy Spirit and a friend of his is saying you've got to do something else. Can I tell you the gospel is powerful? And the gospel transformed and even crushed and destroyed a nation known as Rome. That empire was crushed over time, its impact and what it was because of a culture shift known as the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this letter speaks to that. You know, relationships are challenging. They're tough. I mean, look at, if you look at this story, you've got three or four individuals, and Paul is writing to a couple of women as well, possibly a wife of one of the individuals and a sister of another, and he's speaking to this home church is what it is that this businessman is hosting. He's got a small group, if you will. And Paul is addressing on how they handle this bondservant, this Onesimus. When he rejoins Philemon, this is how you handle it. You don't kill him. He's a brother in Christ now. Because of Jesus and the grace of God, what do you do? That hasn't changed, by the way. Thank God we're not literally killing each other. Hopefully we're not looking down upon each other based on socioeconomic class skin color that would be sinful that would be wrong but we still struggle with different backgrounds different ages different parts of town all under the roof of what the grace of God being saved by his grace now why and how do we do life together and for some of us every time the pastor goes before you every fall and starts talking about group ministry you close up eh. pastor I'll give, I'll hang out, I'll serve, I'll do this. But once you start talking about anything outside of Sunday, I'm, I've been burnt before. I've been hurt. It's awkward. I can't do it. I don't want to. Do we not want greater impact? Do we not want greater growth? Do we not want to see this gospel spread to all? Yes, hopefully we do. And a part of that, not all of it, but a part of that is discipling each other. Doing life together outside of Sundays. Talking over the word of God together. Speaking to the fresh manna of what God is bringing from the heavens in our lives. And speaking to what we might think is the mundane is actually the miracles of God. And as we testify to this, life change happens. And it's in the small things. Guys, we are going to see that which we seek. We're going to see it. I just want to encourage you to consider it. So we do not neglect the potential of what a relationship may hold. So let's dive into the Word of God together. Philemon, there's only one chapter. So it's not hard to find it. Once you find it, you're there. It's all right there. 
Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of your faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. In two weeks, I will dive more into this chapter, but that's all the scriptures from this chapter I will read today. Let's talk about point number one. Thankfulness in my prayers. That's what Paul said. Paul was praying for his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. May we pause just for a moment. How many of us pray And two, how many of us actually pray for each other? Huh. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is amazing. Prayer can do great things, not just for us, but for others. A pastor, while walking in a trail in Alaska, great man of faith, walking down a trail, Suddenly, right in front of him, 50 yards, a grizzly bear. How many know that's, that's going to point you into a position? If you're not a person that prays, you're probably going to pray right there. He's a great evangelist. The first thing he thought of was, Lord, please save this bear. <laughs> because he assumed if this bear got saved, then he probably wouldn't eat him. Lord, save this great bear. All of a sudden, this bear lifts up his hands, looks to the heavens. There's a beam of light on him. And he said, God, thank you for this meal I'm about to eat. <laughs> Thankfulness in prayer. Do we do that? Do we pray? And are we thankful for each other? Even those... <clears throat> People who need more grace in our lives, or we need to give more grace to. Uh, A relationship that is commonly used as an illustration is marriage. The Bible uses it as an illustration. I want to speak to the married people in here. I know that you thought this was the case. I got married so that someone could boost my ego. I got married so that I could just be the happiest person on the planet. If the purpose of your existence is to be more like Christ, is it possible that your key relationships are there to chafen you, to even borderline irritate you at times, or shall I say, challenge you? For actually the purpose of marriage is not happiness but holiness. God gave you a mate for one flesh to look like Christ and to glorify him and him alone. For the world will tell you it's for your satisfaction and your happiness, right? And there should be some times of wholeness and fullness and happiness. But if you go into it with that, guess what? Your mate's going to fail you. And it's in those moments whether you decide whether or not you're dependent on your mate or on him. Colossians 4, 2 says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Being watchful in it, in thanksgiving. How do we pray? With an attitude of gratitude. That's the posture in which we should be in, especially as we pray for each other. God, thank you for that person that financially blessed me, and God, I ask that you bless them. And God, thank you for that person that I almost flipped off, but God, thank you for giving giving me them because they're going to help me on how I'm actually supposed to respond. 
Thank you, Lord, for everyone that you've given me in my life. And maybe God's given you some people to show you how not to act. We should trust him. God is faithful and trustworthy. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. We don't have to have this thing all figured out. We've got to trust him. It's for those very reasons that we need to pray. Because praying for ourselves and praying for others is something God commands us to do. Why in the world would God command us to do something? You know, praying is a very easy thing to question. God, why would I need to pray if God already, if you already know what I need, if you already know my heart, if you're so wise, then why do I need to even in, in, in lean into you? Why do we need to pray? Wouldn't it be better just to trust him and, 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 and he's going to do what's best for me because he loves me? It's true that God is wiser than us. 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the wickedness of God is stronger than men. So it's for that very reason, guys, we have to pray. Praying for others is a recommended source of healing. Look at James 5 and 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayers of a righteous person has great power as it is working in us. It is necessary that we surrender and trust God for it saves our souls. But connecting with God's people heals our souls. How powerful is that insight? But it's true. Along with confession, James tells us that the prayer of a righteous person has great power. It works. Let us be reminded of what righteous is. Because I know a lot of times we put pressure on ourselves. I don't know about you, but I put pressure on myself of what that looks like to be right before the eyes of God. But remember, we're not operating in works. We're operating in a freedom of the grace of God. So we're reminded in Romans 5, 1, that therefore, since we have been justified by what? Faith, not works. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a righteousness that's placed upon us. And because of that salvation, I come to a throne of grace and I pray for you. Jesus told us to pray in his name, John 14 and 13. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Think about this. When, when we do something in the name of someone, it is on the basis of their wishes. Think about that in your own life. Your parents tell you, go do something. It's what they wanted you to do, and you carried that out. I know that I would go to my sibling and say, Dad said. Anybody ever done that before? You knew it carried more weight than you just saying, telling your sibling what to do. So if the Lord says it, it may carry a little more weight. Do you know God's wishes? Do you know God's desire for you? It's found in his word. So when we pray, we come in alignment with God's word and we are ambassadors of God. So when we come to the Father in prayer in the name of the Son, we're coming on behalf of the wishes of what God has already said and promised in your life. So we come into what? alignment and surrender to the Spirit of God and the Word of God, and we pray His Scriptures over our lives and over each other, and that is profound, that is powerful, that is anointed, and that is transformative. But how do I know how to pray if I don't know His Word? I've got to know His wishes. I've got to know His promises. I've got to know His desires for me and for you. Prayer is not about getting everything we want or keeping others safe or just healthy and all that. Those are great things, and God can do those things. But prayer is a powerful way for us to get to know the Father's heart, to get to know Jesus' desires. Our prayer life can grow us in our relationship with God. But you know what else it does? If I'm effectively praying for each other, I get to know what's going on with you as well. Prayer strengthens 
both of these relationships. 1 John 5 and 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. According to what? His will. What is his will? It's his word. You want to really have an effective prayer life? Pray his word. Pray his word every day. Pray his word. You stay focused, you stay on point, and you're in the will of God. If we come to God in gratitude and and we pray for each other, prayer draws us not only closer to him, but it draws us closer to each other. Starting tomorrow, 7 a.m., we will gather for an hour every day right here in the sanctuary. I want you to really prayerfully consider being with us. If you can make it, if you can't, we'll be able to post the link on how to join us online. But we are going to pray together every morning for 21 days. Tomorrow starts day two. Today we're gathering corporately. We've got some prayer going on. We'll wrap up with prayer. So we're counting this as day one. But please consider being with us every single day. There will be information online. You'll be able to link with us either through our website or our Facebook. So please do that. I don't believe that we should just pray prayers without legs or we should preach sermons without opportunity. So I'm encouraging you to pray for each other. But one of the ways we can do that is even portable. Whether you're at home, you're on your way. Some of you are already in process of going to work. I get that. But we'll be here at 7 a.m. Number two. Love and faith we have towards Jesus and the saints. Philemon is saying here, Paul is saying to them, literally, that we are to have love and faith, not just toward Christ, but also the saints. It's one thing to love God, but loving others. Let's just be honest. That can be very difficult. Why? Because there's difficult people. I'll be honest with you. You're probably more difficult than you think you are. Right? Right? Somebody say amen. (laughs) A pastor asked his small congregation, raise your hand if you got an enemy. Everybody raised their hand. But this faithful older gentleman by the name of Bill, 95 years old, pastor was almost taken back. I know he heard me. Bill's faithful. So he asked again because, you know, he didn't respond. Everybody else, if you have an enemy, raise your other hand. Bill's looking right at him. Stoic. No hands raised. Right after service, everybody's, Bill, come here. 95 years old. Bill, I asked the question twice. Who has an enemy? Everybody raised their hand but you. How come you don't have any enemies? He said, I'm 95. You just got to outlive them. Christian faith requires that we love. We have faith not only to God, but actually toward each other. Let's look at 1 John 4, 19 through 21. This first scripture of 19 says, We love because he first loved us. Spurgeon said that this means that it is true that he loves us now. Do you believe it? That's a great question to ask for all of us. Do you believe it? Oh, if you do really believe that he has loved you so, sit down, turn the subject over in your mind, and say this to yourself, Jesus loves me, Jesus chose me, Jesus redeemed me, Jesus called me, Jesus has pardoned me, Jesus has taken me into union with himself. That's a beautiful thing. To just pause for a moment, to believe that, it's transformative. It does something so deep within you that even if you don't feel like it, you recognize, I have to love others. Because why? He first loved me. I've got to respond to him in adoration and in affection. Unto him, because why? He first loved me. Do you believe it? 
Paul spoke to this, and I'm going to read it in a moment, but I want to share another quote from Spurgeon that says, This is the fact for every true follower of Jesus. There is no exception to this rule. If a man loves not God, neither is he born of God, show me a fire without heat, then show me regeneration that does not produce love to God. When I was really, really young, I heard my father make this statement. I was talking to him about a friend of mine who was mulling over something pretty tedious. Really not a big deal, but he was struggling with it. My dad simply said, he just needs to fall in love with Jesus. It seemed really brash and like, I don't get that exactly, but I get it. Boy, do I ever get it now. Because sand in the shoes doesn't make your toes so raw when you look up at the ocean. It just doesn't. It goes away. What's the ocean? It's God. It's a focus on him. It's a focus on his characteristics. It's a focus on who he is. Yet he loved me. Yet he pursued me. Yet he forgave me. And a lot of things can wash away if I keep that perspective. Continuing on in 1 John, it says, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. This is so powerful. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him for their sake died and was raised. There is a death that happens in this newness in Christ. There is a new life in him, and it's his love. His love controls us. Another version would say, you probably knew this, compels me. This, you know what this Greek word means? It means to hold together. You know what makes this work? Do you know what keeps this moving? And if we lose this, it doesn't work. It's the love of Christ. I am compelled to love him back. I am compelled to love you because I've not forgotten that he loved me. Jesus said, love God and love others, right? He said, of all the commandments, these are the two greatest. Let's go back to Philemon 1.5. Love and faith we have toward Jesus and the saints. What is love? Love is found in 1 Corinthians 13. I want you to hear this. We know it. You've ever been to a wedding before you've heard this, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things. These are the three words I want you to hear. Hopes all things, endures all things. God first loved us. We respond in loving him. He is faithful to us. We respond in being faithful to him. But it says in this Philemon, Paul says, love and faith unto Jesus our Lord and to all. Everybody say all. all. Even the tough ones, all the saints. Love each other and believe in each other. Hope all things. I don't know about you, but I sure could use some people that are hopeful about my future. That are hopeful about my tomorrow that are hopeful that I'm going to look more like Jesus tomorrow than I do today. I'm going to pray for that in you and believe that in you. I'm going to believe that his word will not return void. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may what? Abound in hope. Not just a little bit, but a whole lot of hope. When I see you, I'm hopeful for what God is going to do 
in your life. When you see me, you're hopeful for what God is going to do in my life. What kind of culture and environment would that look like? And how am I supposed to know if you feel that or not if I'm not doing life with you? If I'm not having, praise God, coffee with you. Amen? Coffee helps. Some of us, you shouldn't talk to us or pray with us until we've had it. Amen? This really moves something. This, 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 this concept of what I'm talking about, receiving His love, responding by loving Him, commanded to love each other, this all comes together in John 13, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And this is the kicker, listen to me. By this, by what? By what he just said. Receiving the love from the Father. Loving him back. Loving each other. By this, all people will know that you are my, I would even like to say it this way, followers, my disciples, if you have love for one another. My disciples. One of the greatest testaments to the reality that God is alive, that God is real, that God is moving, is healthy relationships with his people. I cannot encourage you enough to do life together. In doing so, it's a testament to others. I want you to hear me. The visual of the cross. Jesus died on that tree. We know he rose again out of a tomb three days later. I've said this before, but I want you to hear me. At the heart of Christ lies two directions of two pieces of wood. One was vertical. It brought heaven to earth. For the Bible says that for God so loved you, he so loved the world that he sent his son. Sent his son down to us, to dwell with us, to die, to raise again. Your sin required a cost, a ransom. And it was the blood of his son, the lamb of God. He reconciled us with the Father. When you look at that cross, you see this relationship. Oh, how thankful I am that one day I'll look him in the eyes. I'll give him a hug. I'll praise him at his feet and I'll thank him for what he did for me. And I don't ever want to get over that. I want to be humbled. I want to be honoring. I want to be worshipful unto him. But Jesus also from that cross, not only did he worship his father, not only did he connect heaven and earth, but he reconciled each other. For the horizontal motion, and I believe direction, was a speaking to these relationships. So at the heart of Christ, where those two pieces came together, is what he said, a new commandment I give you. Love God and love each other. God is good. He is faithful and trustworthy. He is loving toward us. If we will just trust this to be true and we respond with love, we respond with faithfulness and we respond with trust toward him and action that follows that is we do the same for each other. I would never say depend on each other. Our dependency is upon God, but our expression of that dependency is we love each other. Even if we don't feel like it, we need to strive to do life with each other, praying for each other, trusting God's word for each other. Remember this, the gospel is not only about justifying ourselves with the Father, reconciling our sinfulness with us and a perfect and holy God, but it's also to reconcile each other, to bring all walks of life together under the cross. Why? 
that God might be glorified. That God might be glorified. That the gospel would be elevated because we have love for one another. I want you to stand to your feet. Father, Lord, help us. These prayers, Lord, you prayed in your word. These prayers we should pray for each other. Lord, we, we pray for our faith. Luke 22 says for us to pray for each other's faith, that it would be elevated. So God, I pray now that all of our faiths will rise in you. That temptations of this world will dwindle. That we would become unified under your cross. That we would become sanctified, less of us and more of you. God, I pray that in the name that is above all names, that we would all be strengthened by your spirit, rooted and grounded in love, able to comprehend your love for us, that we might be filled in the fullness, overflowing God with you. This is in the name of Jesus we pray. Help us to be great, gracious. Help us to have gratitude, God, as we pursue you and each other. Draw us ever closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let us worship together again. Come on, let's worship. softly again in a moment, but until they do, if our prayer team could come forward. 
This is an opportunity that if today you're online and you don't know Jesus, make a comment below, let us know. Send us a message, DM us. We would love to take you through the next steps of receiving Jesus. If you don't know Jesus today, you wanna receive his grace and his mercy, come forward today. This is your opportunity to respond. We would be honored to pray with you that you would receive Christ. But maybe you're a child of God already. You know that to be true, but you just need a touch of the Lord today. This is an opportunity, honestly, for our lives to line up with his word. So I ask you as we go back into the song, if you have any need at all today, please come forward. We'd be honored to pray with you. Let us continue to worship you. We just pray for you right where you are precious heavenly father for those online right now for those in this house right now help us lord if we're in a position god where you're speaking to an area of our lives help us to turn away to repent to trust you help dependency rise help faith rise God, we are so thankful today that you first loved us. That out of a place of adoration, appreciation to you, we are so thankful, God. Help us to be so gracious. Help us to be so grateful for who you are and what you have done. And God, as we position ourselves and we're postured in that way, Lord. May that reflect in our actions toward each other. Our desire, God. Even our tensions, Lord, to step out. To trust, God, that godly relationships in your house are what you've called us to have. Give us strength, Lord. And I ask that you move on behalf of everyone who's responded today. Lord, that their lives, again, would line up with your word as we trust you evermore. We give you praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Stay to your feet. I want to bless you before you go. If you can put your palms up. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for being a part of our amazing Sunday. I want to remind you as we're going back into the fall, be inviting people, be invitational, be asking people to come with you on Sunday. God bless you. Father God. We thank you for this amazing, amazing opportunity. You're a good God. We are thankful. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your cross. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you just burn within all of us, God. Burn bright. Let your light so shine 
unto others, God, that they would glorify you because of what they've seen in us. Go before us, God. Jesus, give us your peace. We pray these things in Jesus. And God, we thank you that in him we get to do these three things. We get to know and share together. Amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you Wednesday night at 7 o'clock.